Should I start? Yeah, 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 please. Go ahead. Okay, good. So, yeah, first of all, thanks for sending the email, contact me and, uh, let's say, arrange this meeting. Uh, I've been a lot, uh, like, uh, checking on what you guys are doing and uh, I like a lot of the initiative. So, let me tell you just very fast, who am I, just to, to meet ourselves. Oh, I'm a researcher in theoretical physics and now I'm uh, uh, working at the Institute of Theoretical Physics here in Madrid, Spain. And meanwhile, well, if you're interested in actually what I'm doing, you can just click on Google Scholar Archive or just check my website. And I'm also running some kind of, uh, let's say, collateral initiative linked to basically science and communication. This is like a, a, a webinars platforms where every week we, we, we invite people and we make online seminars. So if you're interested, just have a look. And this is more like related to science and communication and uh, uh, just kind of, let's say, uh, digging around the science problem with some, with some fun and some jokes. So that said, uh, very, very briefly, my expertise is uh, in the middle between, let's say, gravity, which I guess is what you are most interested in, and condensed matter. And uh, so, for example, you can see I wrote a book where I actually explain better this connection and uh, I, I explain basically a guide where this connection lies in. So if you are more interested, just have a look. So uh, what I find very interesting in physics in general, and uh, I bet you, you agree with me, is basically this amazing interplay of connections between different areas, different disciplines, and different aspects which are linked with nature. And uh, one of the examples of this surprising interdisciplinarity is basically what I'm, I want to talk to you about it today. And uh, the plan of the talk uh, is more or less the following. So I'll start uh, explaining you where, uh, where all this starts. So the fundamental questions, which are basically related to quantum gravity, string theory, and field theories. And I will jump basically to tell you some aspects which are fundamental for the tools that we're gonna use, which relates to the, what is called the holographic principles, which has a lot to do with black hole physics. And then I will end up with some speculation about condensed matter, hydrodynamics, and actually the relations with quasi-crystals and gravity. So since I, I don't know exactly the, uh, the audience, I plan the talk to be quite, uh, let's say, uh, divulgative. I'm not entering a lot into the details of the computation, but feel free to interrupt me whenever you like, and uh, I can expand on, uh, on, any, on any page you like. So that said, uh, what, um, what were we really doing? So what I'm gonna tell you today is that there is a surprising connection between condensed matter, let's say, system and gravitational system. And, and these, of course, this kind of connection that here takes the, the acronym of ADS-CMT, ADS stands for anti deceiver space-time and CMT for condensed matter theory, can be viewed from different point of view. And this is what I find very exciting of this topic because basically, uh, it can interest and excite a lot of different people with a lot of different backgrounds. So string theorists, for example, are very interested in this kind of, of framework because they can find new string solution. They can have quantum gravity toy models, like for example, this SYK model that everybody is discussing recently. And of course, uh, they can discuss the emergence of space-time from let's say different framework. Relativistic people, like let's say general relativity people, are interested because there is a lot of black hole physics here and a lot of numerical relativity. And this can lead, of course, to new ideas for cosmology. And condensed matter people are interested in this kind of framework uh, because there are a lot of situations, and I will show you a bit better later, uh, where basically the standard condensed matter framework are, are not useful anymore, or better, are not applicable. And Basically, the, the, the fundamental reason why these standard frameworks are not applicable is one is strong coupling, and this is very linked with the absence of quasi particles. So this makes that basically the object, the fundamental objects that you want actually to, to use to write your theory are not so fundamental. And, uh, and therefore, the dynamics becomes kind of collective, and this is really hard uh, to describe in terms, for example, of an Hamiltonian or a Boltzmann equation, etc. I will show you much later. Um, some details. So this is a bit the, the, the interdisciplinarity that I was telling you. And, but, but let me start from the, the basics, which is basically 
uh, why this kind of connection is interesting and why and where it, it was born. So physics. So physics, uh, in general, in physics, we are very good at computing observable when, let's say, a coupling or a certain parameter is small, right? Then we can use perturbative expansions. And here, for example, this is just a sketchy idea of what I'm talking about. Imagine this black box is the observable you want to compute, whatever it is, and you have a parameter in the system, which I call G, which is small. Then you can easily solve basically the dependence on this system in a perturbative way. So you start from the zero order approximation and you go on and on. And these, despite it looks very simple and maybe a bit naive, it's a very powerful technique, which basically it's recasted in the, in the use of basically Feynman diagram, which are exactly this kind of expansion, right? So you start adding corrections, corrections, and this gives a lot of amazing results. Here I cite just one, which is the geomagnetic factor of the electrons. So here you can see that experimentally you have uh, almost 11 digits of precision and you can get all of them with Feynman diagrams. So there are around 1000 Feynman diagrams, you sum all of them and you get basically this number correct at 11 digits. And this is kind of amazing. But this is not what I wanna talk about today. So today I want to talk about situations when actually these couplings or this parameter is not small. So imagine that now you have a system where for a certain reason, and we'll discuss some of the reasons, this parameter is not small. And by not small, I mean that in, a, let's say, a dimensionless scale, this is order one. So if now this is order one, it's clear that if I start summing terms, the terms would become larger and larger and larger. And therefore, it doesn't make any sense to cut this series somewhere and say, this is my answer. Because basically, the next term will be more important than the previous. Right? So this kind of expansion is completely opposite. And this is exactly the regime that we call strong coupling. And this is one of the reasons why, for example, standard techniques, in this case, for example, perturbation theory, does not work. So if you want really to push this perturbation theory, it's exactly the same like basically eating a soup with a fork. You won't get out of it. And uh, this is the reason why we need something different, at least in this situation. Now, Examples of this kind of situation, well, the most known example is certainly uh, quantum chromodynamics, QCD. So we know that the coupling that, uh, let's say, uh, determines the interactions of quarks and gluons in, in our matter grows at low energy, right? So this is just a schematic picture. This is what is called the beta function that controls basically how this coupling scales with energy. And if you go at low energy, what you see here is that basically this coupling grow. And it grows so much that at a certain point it's clearly bigger than one. And this is basically all the trouble with QCD, right? Because QCD is free at large, uh, at large energy. So it's a free theory. It's easy to solve. But then when you go low in energy, you get into trouble immediately. And that's the reason why basically confinement, it's a very hard based tackle, right? Because here the coupling, you cannot do any approximation, at least in the usual uh, let's say degrees of freedom. And this is the reason why, for example, perturbation theory and Feynman diagrams in this area are completely hopeless again. Now there is another uh, situation which is very well known and uh, let's say recently very important also for technological and uh, let's say development, which is ITC superconductor. So what are, are, are these, uh, these materials? So these are material of different kinds uh, which exhibit a superconducting transition, so they become superconductors at very high temperature. <sighs> but I will explain a bit better later what I mean by high temperature. And here you can see basically a schematic of how this temperature grows in the year. So this was basically, this is basically the, the, the lowest temperature at which we know superconductor. And now you can see that, okay, this is not very updated, but already in 2015, we have superconductors are basically 200 Kelvin, which is, in the terms of condensed matter scale, a huge temperature, a huge energy. Now, why this is, uh, this is very puzzling? Well, this is very puzzling because uh, how we understand in condensed matter theory of superconductivity, we understand it with what is called BCS theory, which takes the name from these three gentlemen, which are Nobel Prize in physics. And the, the two basic substantions of this theory is that the normal state, so basically a metal, is nothing else than the bunch of electrons push them together, that because of Pauli repulsion, they create what is called the Fermi surface, okay? So the Fermi surface is basically the, the basics for BCS theory, and the superconductor arises as an instability of this kind of object. 
Now, the strange thing is that if we go back a second to this kind of phase diagram, we'll see that the, we see that the normal phase, which is more or less here, is what is called strange metal. This means that it does not follow Fermi liquid theory. So there are several ways to see these. I, I'm not going to enter in the details, but the, the problem is that you can see already the problem. So the starting point at which the instability enters is already violating basically the, the, the fundamental assumptions of BCS. And this is recasted also in, in a different feature, which is if you, if you allow BCS theory to be basically your descriptions, you can easily uh, find out that the maximum critical temperature at which superconductivity can come is around 30 Kelvin. And the reason why is that in BCS theory, superconductivity is basically produced by the coupling of two electrons in what is called a Cooper pair. And this coupling is mediated by phonons, at least in the standard BCS theory. This means that the critical temperature is basically related to the coupling of this phone. So in order to have superconductivity at very high temperature, you need a super strong glue that keeps together this Cooper pair. And we are again in the same problem because if you need a super strong glue, you cannot use perturbation theory and BCS is a perturbative theory at small coupling. So again, it's not a surprise that BCS theory failed. Now, there are other reasons why, let's say, standard theory fails. And one that I, I like quite a lot is basically strong correlations. So strong correlations is slightly different from strong coupling in the sense that uh, you have to understand it as the loss of individuality. I like a lot of this example, right? Because imagine, so we understand the dynamics of let's say a droplet of water quite well, but it's quite clear without many explanation that if you try to, for example, explain waves in the oceans using this kind of description, so using, using basically a microscopic description of the molecules of water, you won't get that far. Right? So this loss in the, of individuality is basically uh, shown in the fact that the dynamics of the waves is a totally collective dynamics, which arise, uh, let's say, beyond the interplay of the single microscopic elements of the system. Okay, so this is, is quite well summarized by what, what Aristotle say, that the wall is much greater than the sum of its parts. And this is, again, the reason. So the problem here is that usually when you do a description, so you start from some particle, some fundamental constituent, let's say your molecule water, and till you are here, that's fine. But if you are now here, you have to find out how to describe these things in terms of collective degrees of freedom. And this is much harder because these collective degrees of freedom are most of the time emergent. Okay, so they're not there in the system. They just appear because the complicated interplay and dynamics of all the constituents. Now, this caused a lot of problems because of the following. So in, uh, in Knesmarer, when you want to talk about transport, and by transport, I mean computing things like the conductivity, the specific heat, the thermal transport, the, uh, all these kind of properties, what you use is basically uh, the theory that this guy invented, so Boltzmann theory. And Boltzmann theory, it's again, uh, let's say, founded on the fact that you have basically specific and well-determined particle. If you don't have this particle, these equations, you can basically throw it in the garbage and you have to find something else. And that's the, the, the challenge, finding something else. So this is basically a little summary of why this kind of correspondence and duality that I'm gonna present in the, in the next slide, it's important and it's actually needed, or at least it's, it's uh, hopeful, to, hope, hope, hopeful to be needed in, uh, in solving some kind of problem like the one that I discussed. So just remember, basically, strong coupling, strong correlations, there are a lot of unexplained phases and mechanisms that standard physics fail to explain. And this is most of the time related to the fact that there is a very non-trivial collective behavior and emergent phenomena appear. So before I pass to the new tool, uh, this is a good moment for maybe questions. Any questions so far? Good, okay, so now let me explain you what we're gonna do with, with this problem. So what is the idea? So the idea goes back to 1998, and uh, it was basically discovered by this gentleman, Professor of Princeton, Juan Maldacena. The idea is that there is a duality between condensed matter theory, or actually in much more general quantum field theory, so whatever field theory which, which you can imagine, and theory of gravity. So what does it mean? Well, it means very brutally that there is a connection 
that basically allows you to jump from one side to the other and use it at your advantage. And in our case, the advantage is that if we have a lot of problem where this condensed matter, let's say, system or our quantum field theory is very hard, well, what we want to do, we want to use basically this bridge to recast completely this problem in terms of gravitational degrees of freedom and trying to solve it on this side. Uh, Matteo, just about the previous part. Yeah. When, it, when you say there are no quasi a particle, yeah. do, you, do you mean that the, there are no fundamental parts and the collective excitation is what we call quasi particle, or, or do you mean there are? Yeah, so the, the following. So, yeah, so what I have in mind as quasi particle is the following. So, imagine, uh, so you have an excitation, okay? And imagine uh, for the moment if it, it, that's a fundamental excitation, okay? So, this is clearly not always the case in condensed matter. For example, sound is definitely not a fundamental excitation, right? It comes from some collective dynamics, and there are plenty of these situations, right? So, uh, and the idea is that when you have couplings or interactions or dissipations, basically you create a lifetime for your particle, okay? And when basically you crank up too much this coupling and this dissipation, basically the lifetime of your particle becomes so small that basically you don't have a, a well-defined particle anymore. So as you were saying, you have basically a collective descriptions, but you don't see any clear peak. So for example, if you do a scattering experiment, if you have a particle or a quasi-particle, you will see a clear excitation at a certain energy and at a certain momentum. And that's your quasi-particle. Now, there are cases where actually you do neutral experiments, scattering experiments, or Brahman experiment, or whatever you want, and what you see is basically an incoherent flat response. Meaning that there is no single excitation that you can single out from the rest of the spectrum. And this is very problematic because then you cannot say that the dynamics is just determined by basically this particle, but you have basically a bunch of particles, a, a sea of particles, and you have to consider all of them because they are all equally important. Okay, thank you. So that's the thing, yeah. So yeah, uh, pictorially, uh, this is a bit the situations. So what we want to understand is basically, uh, let's say systems where, which we don't understand, of course, and uh, what we are, we are doing is we are kind of mirroring them in theory of gravity that I will show you in certain limit is actually quite easy, it's classical gravity. And this is what we know to compute. So what I will show you are examples of this type where we do computations on this side and to try to understand something on the other side. Now, uh, this is again, this is of course not a new idea, right? So the idea is it's very nicely interpreted by this Asher painting is just the idea that a certain system, a certain physical system can be interpreted in terms of different degrees of freedom. And depending on which degrees of freedom you are choosing, basically the system or the computations can be harder or easier. And this is of course not new at all. So for example, if you're familiar with condensed matter, the Ising model, which is a simple model of spin, that's exactly how it's solved in two dimensions, right? Doing a duality. And there is even a more famous example of duality, which is light, right? So the, the big question is, is it light a wave? Is it a particle? Is it both? Well, depending on the situations, we know that certain phenomena of light are much easier to be understood in terms of a wave. You can imagine, for example, diffractions or interference. And there are other phenomena, for example, you can imagine the, the photoelectric effects that are understood much better in terms of particles. So, here you have these two descriptions that are dual to each other in the sense they are interchangeable. But of course, depending on the situation, one of the two is harder. And that's exactly the kind of game that we're gonna play. Now, let's, let's go a bit more now into the, the details and the physics. So the, the idea that quantum field theory and gravity are somehow connected is not new again. It goes back at least to, to the work of Gerard Tooft in 74. So what Tooft observed in 74 is that if you take a field theory, and for simplicity, let's take a field theory with a SU N gauge group. And you take basically this N, so the rank of your gauge group, to be very large. Okay? You do basically an expansion in this N, what is called the 1 over N expansion. Well, what you find out is that your theory simplifies brutally, and only some of the diagrams that you need to compute are still there. All the rest are zeros. 
And it turns out that if you write down an expansion of these types, you, you realize that the, basically the, the, the generator of the correlation functions in this quantum field theory can be expanded in a, in a certain perturbative fashion. And the amazing thing is that this perturbative fashion, as you, you see here, basically depends on the genus of the diagram. So what happened is that this is exactly what we're doing all the time in string theory when we compute basically perturbative, let's say, diagram and interactions, right? So the difference between basically quantum field theory and string theory is that in string theory, the real expansion is not in the coupling because in string theory, there are no parameters. Everything is dynamical. But what happened is that the expansion, it's in genus. So in basically the, the topological uh, numbers of the surface. So the first term is a sphere with zero holes. The second one is basically a donut with one hole and so on and so far. And quite amazingly, you can basically uh, relate this expansion in field theory exactly with the expansion in string theory, one to one. And you can match all basically the, the, the parameters. And here, for example, I show you one. So this N that I was saying you take it to be large or is basically the coupling in string theory. So considering uh, a large N field theory, uh, it's basically the same of considering a string theory in, uh, in the weak couple. Now, there is another way where, of course, there is a huge connection between gravity uh, and uh, field theory. And this is also where it was born, the idea of holography. So the idea of holography, or the so-called holographic principle, started from basically the, the results of Bekenstein and Hawking on the area low of the black hole entry. So what do we know? So if you take a generic field theory, and you, you, you take, let's say, a system which lives in a volume, let's say, V, the numbers of degrees of freedom is always extensive. And it, it basically scales like the volume. So the more the volume, the larger the volume, the more the degrees of freedom, right? That's kind of obvious. Now, black holes are different, actually are very different. And we know that from, that, from, from the results, that the entropy, and remember, the entropy is just counting the degrees of freedom, right? Because in the is that in the Neumann language, it's just the logarithm of the number of the freedom, is basically proportional to the area. And this is very striking if you think about it, because it means that all the informations that are contained in these black holes are actually all encoded on the surface of this black hole. So basically, you, there is the one dimension which is kind of useless, totally useless. So you could write a field theory living on the, on the surface of this black hole, and this field theory will contain all the informations that are in this black hole. So this suggests somehow a connection between theory of gravity, which lives in, say, D dimensions, and theory of field theories, which lives in one dimension less. And there is another uh, nice way to actually understand this kind of relation between D and D plus one dimension, which is RG flows. So what is RG flows? So in physics, all the time, what we're interested in is basically how the dynamics change with the energy, right? And so this is formally called renormalization group flow. And it's basically, you give me a coupling or a parameter, and I have to tell you how this coupling, the value of this coupling or this parameter change when I change the energy. Okay, and very brutally, basically the idea of Kalanoff and Wilson is that changing the energy scale corresponds to go to basically more and more coarse grain description. Okay, so if I'm going to the IR, so to low energy, I'm basically coarse graining the system and looking at long wavelengths. Okay? And this, of course, can be formalized in what is called the beta function equation, which is exactly the equations that, go, that says how the, the coupling runs with the scale, with the energy scales. And there is something which is very interesting because if you look at these equations, this is a dynamical equation which is local in the energy scale. So the idea here is what about if this equation is actually on the same ground of the others and the energy scale is just an extra dimension. So instead of living basically in our four dimensional world, for example, you could think, well, we live in a five dimension world where the five dimension is basically energy. And these equations is basically just the equation, the dynamic equations in that direction. Okay, so basically the, the, the RG flows equations are somehow equivalent to a dynamics in an extra dimension that you can think basically uh, as energy. And this says already that there is a connection between basically 
quantum field theories and let's say equ dynamical equations in one dimension more. And this is exactly basically the idea. The idea is uh, formalized a bit more, let's say, uh, formally uh, with these equations, which, which basically encodes all the physics. So let, let me just guide you through these equations. So these equations tell you the following. So imagine you have a field theory. So if you have a field theory, what you want really to compute are correlation functions, right? So two-point functions, one-point function, three-point function. And how you do that? Well, you do it as we always do, right? You define the generator of this correlation function. So you deform the theory with the source, and then you take functional derivative of the source. And that's how you get all the response, all the features of this field theory. Now, these equations tell you that basically this generator that you need to produce all the quantities in the field theory, it's exactly equivalent or dual to basically the gravitational action with certain specific boundary conditions. So this is basically, this equal here is the, let's say that the fundament of this duality, which tells you that these two quantities are related to each other. And therefore, if you want to compute this, you can always go on the other side and compute this. And the, re the response that you will get is exactly the same. So I won't show you, but there are uh, a lot of situations where this kind of equation is proved explicitly, especially for conformal field theory. So if you take theories where basically Yes, there are a lot of symmetries, then you can really compute from, from this side and from this side. And you really see that the computation on the two sides, even though they appear completely unrelated, they give you exactly the same results. So this is quite astonishing because then you can use these things when of course you don't know one of the side. And in the realm of condensed matter, this is used especially to compute two-point functions in linear response theory, which is basically uh, a jargon to say the quantities like conductivities for example, like green function. So this is basically what we do in, in simple words. Now, the, the astonishing thing is also that the following, the fact that black holes behave very, very similarly to quantum suits. So if you take a black hole and you throw, let's say, something, a particle, or you excite it, in, in this way, it, it behaves exactly like a dissipative fluid. So exactly the same like throwing a stone on the surface of the lake, and there are a lot of, let's say, correlations that uh, one can show. For example, one can compute the viscosity of a fluid starting from a black hole. And this is exactly where I want to go. So now I want to show you uh, basically what you can really do with these things and what are the results which are, let's say, uh, obtained and are relevant for our world. So the most famous result is exactly related to the viscosity. So, in uh, 2001, this gentleman uh, proposed a bound on the ratio between viscosity and entropy, which takes the following form. So this says that no matter which system in nature you take, this ratio is always bounded by below by this number. And this is supposed to be a universal bound. Now, here you can see uh, basically a plot, a schematic plot of some of the liquids that we have in nature. So you can see water, helium, and more exotic one. And you can see clearly that the bound, which should be this kind of red line, is never violated. So this bound was basically extracted using calculation of black holes. So computing this viscosity with this black hole that I was telling you, and this is the value that it gives. There are no other theories able to give you this bound. And as you can see here, so far all the experiments done obey this bound. And there is also something much more interesting that the more, the closer you are to this bound, the more strongly coupled. So basically in systems which are easy, which are weakly coupled, the viscosity is very large. So they're up here. And the more you go strongly coupled, you go down. And basically, so this bound is basically putting uh, a limit to the amount of dissipation that you can have in nature. And that's exactly how it's interpreted. So it's interpreted, remember, that the viscosity is basically proportional to the mean free path, so to how far particles propagate in a liquid. And this is related, of course, at, uh, itself to basically the interaction. So the stronger the interaction, the less you travel around, right? Because you scatter a lot. And this bound can be basically rewritten as the existence of a universal minimum relaxation time scale, which is called Planckian relaxation time scale. And it comes totally from quantum physics. 
So you can basically extract this scale from the indetermination principle or the uncertainty. Now, why this is amazing? Because there are other instances where actually this scale is at work. So this is a paper in science where basically they show that a bunch of these strange metals that I, want, uh, I was telling you before, the relaxation time, which is extracted from the conductivity, is exactly following basically this prediction. And this is the idea that basically the strange properties of these strange metals, first of all, for example, the fact that the resistivity is proportional to temperature linearly, which is something very weird for metals, it's related to the, basically the saturations of these bounds that you see here. These are experimental points, and this is basically the universal relations. And you can see that modulo a number of order one, they all lie on the same curve. Matteo, can you go back one slide, please? Yes. Oh, uh, the, the previous one. Yes. So, uh, so it's a strong coupling actually is like less excited like when the you know like when you the previously you showed this uh, the boundary um the uh, i mean when when there is excitation it kind of like a vibrate so like does that mean like when it's more excited it's more like away you know from this like strong coupling um yes. state it, it's Kind of similar. So the, the point is the following. So when you excite, let's say, a material or whatever constituent, there is a typical relaxation time, which is the time at which these things goes back to equilibrium. Okay. Yeah. So now, if the coupling is very, is very strong, is very weak, so okay. basically the interactions are very weak. These things takes a lot to go back to equilibrium. Uh. On, if the coupling is very strong. You perturb it a bit, these things go very fast. And this relaxation time is basically this statement. It's the statement that this is the fastest way any system in nature that follows theory of quantum physics can go. So you cannot go faster than this because otherwise you will violate the uncertainty principle. And okay. of course, the more strongly coupled, the fastest you go. That's okay. basically the idea. Okay. Uh, yeah, and other results. Uh, which, yeah, I want to tell you because actually was found by some of my colleagues here in Madrid, is uh, something uh, very interesting, which is related to what is called, uh, what are called anomalies. So what is anomaly? Well, it is an anomaly is basically an instance where a symmetry, which is a symmetry of the classical theory, is not anymore a symmetry when quantum corrections are included. And there are a lot of them. So here, there is one which is very relevant in this case, which is called mixed gravitational anomaly. So you can see the expressions here, it's not very important. So this is the anomaly. This is the fact that this current is not conserved anymore because this anomaly entered. But the funny thing is that basically you can predict a contribution to the current given by this anomaly. So the, the, the curious thing is that people for a lot, a lot of times hold that anomalies are very high energetic effects, but that's not true. They can have a very strong impact in the infrared at low energy. And this is exactly where these things was measured. So here, this is a paper in Nature, uh, where some of my colleagues here are involved, where they actually managed to measure this contribution in a vile semi-metal. So here you can see the experiment. So vile semi-metal are particular uh, systems where basically the, the, the bands touches at uh, two points, and here the system reacquired basically the relativistic symmetry. So the amazing thing is that they did this computation, and they get this computation was done basically perturbing these black holes in a certain way. They predict this kind of low going like T square and, and like B, and that's exactly what it's measuring the real material. So this is kind of amazing because it, it tells you that basically this duality, which for the moment was basically some blah, 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 and some theoretical, let's say, input, is actually at work in nature. So this is quite astonishing for me. Now, uh, of course, when we are dealing with these uh, holographic, uh, let's say, theories, one of the first, um, let's say, need is to make this realistic. And by realistic, I mean that you have to be able to go the closer possible to basically the, the reality, right? And when you talk about condensed matter, uh, there is one thing which is uh, very important, which is basically the difference between the fluids and the solids. 
But this is basically the standard question, right? The standard question is, which are the phases of matter? Well, the first difference, which uh, I warn you, looks very uh, simple, but it's very subtle, is basically the difference between a fluid and a solid. For example, the first thing that I, I could ask you is, what is the difference between a fluid and a solid? So if I, if I ask you, uh, give me one sentence formally that distinguishes clearly a fluid and a solid. And this is tricky. This is tricky. A lot of people, what they will reply is that you should look at the transverse sector. So, and the transverse sector of the fluctuations contains basically in fluids contain only diffusion. So there is no transverse sound or transverse wave propagating in a fluid, but there are in solid. And that's exactly what you hear when you basically knock a table. Now, this is tricky, but uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to discuss this with you today. But there is something different that I want to discuss. So let's start from a fluid. So a fluid is basically uh, linked uh, and described by uh, viscosity, okay? And, uh, and by dissipation. So the idea is that in a fluid, you have some continuity equations and some, uh, let's say, constitutive equations, which is fixed flow. And the dynamics is basically the dynamics of diffusion, which is exactly what you see if you throw, for example, some colors in water, right? So these things is not propagating like a particle, like a wave. This thing is just diffusing around. Okay, so its mean position is not changing. It's just the variance is just growing. It's just spreading around. And a typical example is what happened in relativistic hydrodynamics, where you can compute these things properly. Now, a solid, it's very, very different, right? A solid is basically contains phonons, which are basically excitations of the, the lattice, if you like. And this phonon has a certain dispersion relations, which is linear, and which is related to basically what we call elasticity, right? Which is the difference, again, between a fluid and a solid. A fluid is not elastic, so this term is zero. Therefore, this means that the velocity of these guys is zero. So there are no propagating waves, which is exactly what I was saying before. Now, formally, from the theory point of view, this is related to the fact that the solid break translations symmetry is uh, spontaneous. And these guys here, the phonons, are nothing else than the Goldstone boson or the solids. Now, where this comes from, that's exactly what I was trying to, to convey, is that a solid can be formally expressed like a material in which translations are spontaneously broken. And I like a lot the idea, this kind of picture for explaining the, the, the breaking of translation uh, spontaneously. So you see the system at the beginning, it's completely rotational invariant, translational invariant, but then when you leave it, the equilibrium position that it chose breaks this symmetry, okay? So the pencil fall down, and now in this, in this configuration, clearly you don't have rotations anymore because you select a direction. And that's exactly the, the kind of physics that gives rise to rigidity, okay? And okay, you can find a lot of, you know, modern treatment in this paper. Now, where this come from, as I was saying, it comes from the existence of a lattice, right? There, are, there is a lattice structure in solids, and the vibration of these lattice structures are the phonons. Now, the questions that I want to kind of address today is the following. Is periodicity and the existence of a periodic lattice really necessary? Or better, what happens if this lattice is not periodic? And this is basically where I want to start. So, of course, at the beginning, in this holographic system, people started from lattices, which were simple. So you can see here some periodic lattice, which is kind of easy. But then basically, basically people jumped quite fast in describing systems which break translation, like for example, this kind of model, but where there was absolutely no uh, periodicity, okay? So these are models that are highly used. So you, you can check the paper or you can ask me, these are the both like hundreds of citations. And they are considered like toy models for describing solids. Now what happened is that if you compute basically the, the spectrum and the excitations in these, uh, in these systems, uh, you find out that basically these phonons are there. So you see clearly uh, when you do the computation, these waves which propagate with a certain speed and the formula actually works pretty well. So this is something that we check in the, this, this paper published in PRL some years ago. But then when you start looking at hydrodynamics, so uh, what happened uh, in the hydrodynamic regime, something weird. So let me first, tell you what I mean by hydrodynamics. So by hydrodynamics, I mean, take a system with a certain basically scale. Like in this case, it's just basically the distance between the two surfers. Now, 
hydrodynamics is the description of these systems at length scales, which are much larger than basically the characteristic scale of the system. So basically hydrodynamics is the theory, the description of slow processes and long distance, which translate in saying that the frequency is small and the momentum is small. So now when we study these hydrodynamics in the systems, what we see is that we see a phonon, which is basically this guy moving here. This is the frequency and uh, this is moving momentum. So this is basically a mode with this kind of dispersion relations. But then there is another uh, Golston mode, which is diffusive, which people call crystal diffusion and which is to me very puzzling. And that's actually what motivated me to write the paper about the quasi crystal. So it's this guy. And my main questions at the beginning, what really can I give basically uh, a description or an understanding of what is this mode? Is this mode real, can be found in, in some realistic manner or not? And uh, my claim, uh, I'll spoil it now, is that basically the reason why you see this mode is that because the system you are considering is a quasi-crystals where periodicity is broken. And this is what is called the phasing mode in quasi-crystals. So I will show you uh, in a while what I mean more uh, specifically. So there are several important points. So the important point is that basically you see this guy, okay? And this guy, very funnily, it does not come from breaking translations. So it's not a standard phonon like I told you before. It's something very different. And it comes from breaking a global internal symmetry of this guy. Okay, so basically, uh, this is, of course, not space-time translation. It's just the fact that there is a shift symmetry in your field. And this configuration can be broken spontaneously. And that's exactly what gives rise to this mode. And it's very funny because uh, diffusive Goldstone bosons are very rare beasts. Usually, a Goldstone boson is a wave which propagates. It's not diffuse. And I will tell you a bit about this story, which I find very interesting. And uh, it's quite new, actually. Now, there are other considerations which led me to basically postulate that, that these guys are quasi-crystals. So the, the first thing is that there is, translation are not broken to a discrete subgroup. So there is no unit cell at all. And these systems are not periodic. Okay, so what I have in mind is something, for example, similar to incommensurate charge density wave, if you're familiar with this, these ideas. But the main, the main important thing is that syst these systems can be even rotational invariant which of course is something very weird for lattice usually. And they can be even scale invariant. So by scale invariant, I mean self-similar. And the other funny thing that appears in this model, and I'm talking about, remember, I'm always talking about gravity model for, for the time being. These systems are most of the time metastable. And this is another feature that they have in common with quasi crystal and here, they, he basically uh, brought me to the, to the idea of quasi-crystals that you, you know probably better than me. So the idea is that, you know, I, I like to sell it like uh, your wife come home and ask you to basically uh, tail uh, the floor of your kitchen, right, with, with, some, uh, with some tailings. And of course, if you're not creative enough, you can think, well, okay, I can do it with periodic structure. And for example, this is a very boring one. And, uh, but of course, people tried to think about this question a long time ago, and Penrose was probably one of the, of the most famous guys thinking about this question and was trying to, to understand if there was a way to actually uh, tessellate the plane with structure which are not periodic. And this is exactly where the, the idea of quasi crystal comes in, right? So you can use more difficult or more complicated structure, geometrical structure, and you can still basically completely tessellate the plane. And quasi-crystal has to be thought somehow as in the middle between a periodic structure and the structure which is completely disordered. So the difference is that basically here, there is still an order. And this is very important, but this order is not periodic. Okay, so if you shift from here to, let's say, here, this structure changes, while here is the same. Now, one description that I learned and that I, I, I found very useful is what is called the superspace descriptions. And now you can already guess why I like a lot of these descriptions, because it involves an extra dimension. So what this superspace description says? Well, it says that if you have a system, and for simplicity here, I draw it one dimensional, and this system is quasi-periodic or aperiodic, so uh, you can always embed it and see it as a periodic structure in one dimension more where you cut basically this periodic structure at an angle, which is irrational. So what does it mean? It means the following. So consider this two-dimensional 
square lattice. Okay, this is very simple. And imagine now to cut it with a line and to project this point on the line. The line would be your real crystal. Okay, the, ex, the extra two dimension, the extra dimensional thing is just a picture, a description. Now it's clear that if you cut this plane at a certain angle, which is, uh, let's say, not irrational, here I take, for example, 45 degrees, it's obvious that the structure that you will get on this line is still periodic. So, of course, the period it will be different, but it's still periodic. But very finally, so what happened is that if you cut this structure now at the angle, which is irrational, you will find that when you project the structure here, the, the system is not periodic anymore. So here you can see, for example, I call this large separation L and the small separation S. And if you write down this sequence, you can really see that there is basically a failure of periodicity at a certain point. Okay? So this, is, this for me was very illuminating because you can always see basically a periodic structure as periodic structure, but with one dimension more. And this is where basically the connection with holography enters. Now, why I was also interested? Well, because uh, amazingly enough, the difference between a periodic crystal and an aperiodic crystal is that in a aperiodic crystal, there is an additional mode, which is called phasen. And this mode is diffusive. So here you can see an experiment, for example, where this mode is basically uh, shown. And where this mode comes? Well, this mode comes from basically the fact that now not only you can basically oscillate in the real direction, so oh, let me see, uh, let me see if I can point you uh, a second. Yeah, now you should see probably my, so you can basically oscillate in this direction, which is the internal space of the crystal. And this will be basically your phonons, but you can also now basically oscillate or displace in this direction. And this is not a real dimension, okay? This is an internal dimension, which is just in your description. But this gives rise to basically this kind of mode. So this kind of mode is very different from phonons because from the real dimensional space or the real dimension in which your crystals lives, phonons are basically the translations of the atom, right? So you can imagine there is a spring and these atoms oscillate and this is a phonon. Phasons are different. Phasons are basically the rearrangements of these particles. And these rearrangements around is basically diffusive. And because it's diffusive and because it costs energy, it's basically thermally activated. So in other words, if you go at zero temperature, you cannot have these rearrangements because you need energy to rearrange this lattice structure. Okay? Now, one thing that uh, I, I bring to I you. A quick question there. Uh, yeah. So even at zero of Kelvin, you can have quantum fluctuations, but would that not contribute to those modes? Yeah, that, that's a good point. So I guess you have in mind like dislocation, disclination, or uh, quantum effects like a BKT transition or proliferation or vortices and things like that. No, so this is a, a different thing. So this mode is not coming from quantum fluctuation. Okay. Yeah. So you will have some actually quantum fluctuations. Usually what they do is that they, they melt the crystal, of course, at zero temperature. So this is quantum melting like a BKT phase transition. But basically what they do is that they, they produce, they, they break the order, but not in, in, in exactly the same way that this mode does. But I agree with you, it's actually quite related because also these locations and the defects can proliferate around and there is the possibility that proliferate through quantum uh, dynamics, like you're saying, yes. But this mode, this mode at zero temperature, basically uh, it's, uh, it's vanished. So you won't see this mode. Okay, you, sounds good, thanks. Yeah. And uh, yeah, here there is like some kind of uh, misunderstanding uh, in uh, at least from, from my side, I don't know if, if it's known, but uh, so what I would like to know and what is the question is, uh, can we understand why this mode is diffusive and quadratic? And there is a, a very strong similarity with another mode, which is very popular in condensed matter, uh, which is known as flexural phonon in graphene. So as you know, graphene now is a very fancy material for several reasons, and graphene is basically uh, made of layers, right? So it's intrinsically very two-dimensional, and the dynamics up, uh, happens on all layers. But of course, there are still fluctuations in the transverse direction. And the fluctuation in the transverse directions give rise to some new object that are called flexural phonon. And the very interesting thing you can see here in experimental plot is that this flexural phonon, despite the other that I show you, is quadratic. You see, with momentum, it grows quadratic and not linear. And one question that, for example, you can ask is, why the hell this mode is quadratic, why this one 
are linear, right? So can we understand this from an effective field theory? Well, there is a recent paper where they do that. And my hope is that similar methods can actually, uh, let's say, uh, bring some light also to the reason why this mode is fused. Now, going back to the internal directions, uh, there is a, a very parallel story with this kind of holographic models that I'm telling you about. So what I told you is that basically this kind of model, so for example, this is the simplest model that you can imagine, where you basically put a field which is linearly in the corner. But clearly, this kind of field break translation, right? Because if you now translate this x to x plus something, clearly this solution is not invariant. But there is also another symmetry which is uh, broken, which is basically sending phi to phi plus a. This is not a symmetry anymore. And this can be basically formalized in two directions. So you have two directions in which you can shift this, this thing. One is the real space-time direction, x. But there is another direction, which is an internal direction, which is phi, which here, for example, I indicate with an arrow that goes into disaster dimension. And there are, so the idea, my idea is that basically the phonons are related to the displacement in this extra dimension. And the reason why these systems are quasi crystal is exactly because you are choosing this kind of profile. So basically, this profile is clearly not periodic, and therefore it, it has these kind of features, and that's why you see that mode. Now, there is another uh, reason, more theoretically, if you like, which, uh, which I find very interesting, which is basically, again, understanding theoretically why these Goldstones are actually diffuses. And the theory of Goldstone boson, I find it extremely interesting. And uh, of course, people uh, always think about, say, the Goldstone theorem. And the Goldstone theorem, what does it tell you, right? The Goldstone theorem tells you uh, that you break a symmetry spontaneously, and you will get at least one mode that goes to zero when the energy goes to zero, right? The massless mode. Now, what people a lot of time misunderstand is that the Goldstone theorem in general does not tell you anything about the number of the Goldstone mode appearing, and it doesn't tell you anything about how this mode has to go to zero. So if you add to the Goldstone theorem basically Poincaré symmetry, or so relativistic invariance, then you can say more. And you can say that for every generator you break, there is actually one mode, and all these modes are linearly in the moment. But what happens is that when you start breaking the symmetry, weird things happen. And these things are realized in nature. And uh, one technical, let's say, uh, point that is uh, to formalize the situation is what is called the watanabe brown matrix. And it's basically a generalization of the Gaussian theorem for situations where these symmetries are broken. Now, this is kind of understood. And uh, if you're interested, I can just uh, send you the references. But then there is a new thing, which is the following, and which, is, which at least to my knowledge, was first initiated by, by these guys here, which is, can there be a possibility that the Goldstone boson is now an imaginary mode, or is a diffusive mode? And what this guy claims is that if you have dissipations, and if you have like an open system, or for example, a system that can dissipate energy in a bath, then this can happen, and only in that way. And the, the quite amazing thing is that what this guy says is actually realized. And one of the, the most, let's say, artistic uh, situations where this is realized is actually the dynamics of flux. And other situations are actually active matter and open systems. So basically, this is the theoretical descriptions. And you can find actually experimental verifications of this mode. So this mode is seen in realistic situation, right? And what I believe is that this phase and mode in quasi-crystal should be something very similar to that. And here we go back to the question of thermal or not, or zero temperature or not, and you can see clearly that unless you have some kind of dissipation which is quantum, then it's quite clear that you cannot have this mode in a normal system. So I believe that actually you could generalize what I said before if you allow the system to have some sort of quantum dissipation inside. So probably, if you can have some sort of quantum dissip dissipative dynamics, maybe you can see that mode even at zero temperature. And this is related to, to David Common before. 
So, well, just to kind of summarize, uh, what, I, what I, I'm proposing is, uh, and what I found is that there is a very concrete and uh, matching, let's say, correlations between these holographic models, which I, I remind you, I didn't show you uh, the details, but they are totally gravitational system. So it, they have to do, and they deal with the dynamics of gravity. So basically, uh, in order to have to, to compute all of these, you have to solve Einstein equations, et cetera, et cetera. And the funny thing is that I, I can show that basically a lot of these properties are exactly the same properties that you will expect from something like this kind, like a quasi crystals. And this brings me a bit to, uh, to, to your, the idea that I saw in your group going around, which, you know, the, the structure of the space time and the dynamics of quantum gravity can be actually related or understood in terms of this kind of geometric structure. And I, I believe that uh, uh, the, the example that I have is an example that goes exactly uh, in that direction, in the sense that I can really explicitly compute. Of course, it's a toy model, is a simple example that's very far from a like, quantum gravity or the theory of everything. But it's a concrete example where I can compute all the things and I can actually show that what I compute matches with the expectation from the quasi crisp. And so if you want to know more about that, well, th this is the, the publications that is actually publishing uh, PR research, which is open access, so you don't need any affiliations or anything. You can just uh, find it out. And so, yeah, this is a bit the conclusions, which uh, it's basically uh, this nice idea that there are unexpected or maybe expected connection between gravity and uh, for the moment, at least in my setup, gravity is classical, but maybe it could be made quantum and the physics of quasi crystals. So for example, going to, to the question of this mode at zero temperature in the quantum regimes, that could be, for example, the first step to try to go to quantum gravity, right? Because if the dynamics there becomes quantum, then I think it's logical to expect that the dual gravitational descriptions is quantum as well. And yeah, with this, I want to really thank you for the invitation. It was pretty fun and entertaining. I hope you enjoy it. And uh, I'm open to questions of any kind. Uh, Matteo, can you go back to the face on and the phone on part, the, that yeah. slide? Uh, maybe this one? Uh, I think, uh, yeah. Okay, so... You're talking about the difference between the phonon based on the phonon are translations of atoms and the face on the rearrange, uh, rearrangement of atoms uh, when they're thermally activated, uh, which is related to the solid diffusion. It seems like uh, if you go back also, if you go back more, more, uh, here, so if you see on the right side, uh, you know, like for for the quasi crystal, when you generate the quasi crystal from the crystal, like a higher dimensional crystal, and then so you have this window. You must have a window, otherwise you have a dense space. So this window gives you this one dimensional quasi crystal. Uh, so like uh, because previously you mentioned about the excitations, right? Like when you excite when you excite the, um, the system and then the boundaries to start to fluctuate or vibrate. So this is what uh, you know, I talked with Cree uh, uh, sometimes. Uh, like if you, if, if, you, if you imagine like when this cut window, you know, these two black lines that you capture these points inside and project it down to quasi crystal. If you imagine this, uh, when the window is flat like this, and that's like kind of the ground state. And if you imagine when it gets excited, the window start to vibrate or you know excited or so. So if the window goes like up more or down more, and that actually create the face on. So if you imagine this this black window, like if it goes, uh, if it vibrate up, yeah. some of the points outside the window start get inside the window, and some of the point inside the window get out from the bottom. For example, like window 
window vibrate and I actually give you that actually created the kind of face on that we generally see in fossil crystals yeah I totally agree so you you are saying that basically wiggling these kind of lines uh -huh. you create relations yeah. yeah I totally agree so my, my my main questions which I don't know if it's let's say resolved it's uh, why the dispersion relation of this guy is basically quadratic and diffusive and not simply linear like the other. Because we know that, for example, if you perturb this red particle just in the direction here, you get phones which are linear. Mm -hmm. Why, if I wiggle this line, now it's quadratic and not linear? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, that's a question that I have that I'm thinking about in the last uh, weeks. And mm -hmm. uh, that's why I was mentioning that it has some kind of similarities with this problem. Because in graphene, you have basically the excitation on plane, mm -hmm. and the on plane are linear or what are called here LA and TA, or mm -hmm. linear. But the excitation basically exactly, you see here is exactly the same picture, right? Imagine this is the surface that you are wiggling. Mm -hmm. If you wiggle now this surface on the transverse direction, so up and down here, exactly like you were saying, now you see a mode. Mm -hmm. And this is quadratic exactly as the phase in a quasi crystal. Mm -hmm. So why is quadratic? It's explained from symmetries in this paper. So I believe, I'm quite sure that you can kind of use the techniques of this paper and the, the knowledge that we have of quasi-crystals, so the, the, the geometric structure, etc., to actually derive that that mode is also to be quadratic for the same reason. Mm. So that's a bit my picture, but I, I didn't have time to formalize in terms of equations or symmetry. But I totally agree with you. I mean, the physical picture that I have in mind is exactly the one that you pictured before. It's kind uh -huh. of in the transverse directions. And, yeah, uh, and also there is a, you know, there is a quasi-crystal talk that, um, there's a paper also on that, that when they grow the two-dimensional uh, quasi-crystal and at the boundaries, you know, like a, at the boundary when it's not stabilized and then if you see uh, the correspondence to higher dimension, it seems like the window is pretty flat, you know, when, when it's relaxed and then at the boundary, it either goes up or down. So it's not really flat yet. So that's because also the temperature there is not the temperature that when you cool down the, you know, the quasi crystal for it to stabilize. I see. So it's very related. Can you the, the reference then by the email? Uh, yeah, I can find the reference and send it to you. Because okay. then I, I will read it then uh, with more calm after. Mm -hmm. Oh, clear. It looks like you're muted. Yeah. So, Matteo, um, there's been a long standing um, thought process that I've been working on for a few years. Um, and it's a very much a work in progress, but I wanted to share with you uh, a couple elements of that. I started recently talking to Marcelo and David here about it and have had other short term discussions about it. But anyway, what's uh, what I think is interesting is the role of information in complex systems. And one of the most striking examples that I usually introduce when trying to um, impress somebody with this subject is, is DNA. So DNA is a quasi-crystal and it can encode um, vast terabytes of code such as protein folding algorithms. And so if we take a DNA molecule at a certain um, energy and um, we randomize the four letters, then the thermal excitation, the, the, the ambient temperature will cause um, radiation of photons, but it will be non-coherent light. If, and so that non-coherent light will not um, cause the self-organization of higher entropy systems around the DNA. However, if keeping it at the same energy, we allow the four letters to be organized uh, into 
the requisite protein folding algorithm, then the photonic emissions from the DNA will radiate out in, into the, um, the system around it where you have you know, H2O molecules, photons, free, you know, free carbon atoms, and, and simpler and lesser organized biomolecules, right? In some imaginary kind of closed system. Anyway, that, that light that impinges or radiates into this higher entropy system around it uh, will transmit the abstract information of the protein folding algorithm and cause the system to self-organize. But what's interesting to me about that picture is that the system self-organizes not using the energy that the DNA transmitted. I mean, the actual amount of energy necessary to transmit that protein folding algorithm into the EM spectrum is um, vanishingly small. And so, it, and so it is actually the causative actor is the raw information, abstract information in this signal. And the energy that's used is the self energy of the system, right? Of these other lower entropy um, subsystems of this overall system. Um, so anyway, to me, that's just fascinating. And there's many, many other examples of how pure information uh, leads to self-organization of, of systems. So what's so important about solid state physics of quasi-crystals for the discovery of new physics, it's really a treasure trove because Danny Schechtman told me at one of the conferences that I last attended that he estimates that in any, any typical year, there are only 50 people on the whole planet funded that year to work full time on quasi-crystal um, material science. And then if you look at the, the percentage of those 50 that are working in the mathematical abstraction, right, of just the pure mathematics of quasi-crystal, uh, quasi-crystals, um, it's, it's just a few people. So the point, the point there is that quasi-crystals are incredibly arcane. You know, very few people understand the mathematics or the material science of quasi-crystals. And so that makes, it, that makes it an opportunity. It's not hard to understand, it's just arcane. Um, and so one of the things I learned from going to so many quasi-crystal conferences is that some conferences, I estimate over one week that 50% of the PowerPoint presentations are reporting on yet another anomaly in quasi-crystal material science, photonic anomalies, um, other types of quantum anomalies, all types of anomalies, thermodynamic anomalies that are not matching up to any known model. So that makes it an opportunity as you, as yeah. you know. Um, but, but, and the last thing I wanna say about my, my ongoing thinking of this is that a proper um, advancement or clarification of the unification between information theory and thermodynamics and how that all ties into quantum gravity is that, is that it's important to, to pay attention to the fact that, um, that heat, that this idea of resonant pumping, like Froelich resonant pumping, it's the idea that you can take a system of a, cert, a closed system with a certain amount of energy and a certain entropy and you can actually add energy to it to decrease the entropy, increase the emergent information, which then has a cascade effect to then act back upon the system to further self-organize it. Or you can take that same quantity of energy, let's call it 10 joules, and that same quantity of energy um, pumped into the system in a different way would do what it typically does, which is increase the entropy increase the heat um, and so on. And so I think it's important to pay attention to also to aspects of the literature where we're seeing, we're seeing things self-organized. Like I can, have, I can have a quasi crystal at a certain um, entropy, E, and, and then I can have a crystal at that same level of entropy, E. And so therefore the degrees of freedom 
of those two systems are identical. Let's say that I have the same quantity and species of atoms and the same boundary. And anyway, so I have these two systems that are identical in terms of the energy and the types of atoms and the entropy is all identical. But in, in, and so, and so, but in the crystal, the degrees of freedom are distributed and organized in such a manner that there is no meaningful emergent or complex systems information. But the same total magnitude of degrees of freedom in the quasi-crystal case, uh, if it's low enough temperature system, would, would mean that that quasi-crystal is a topological phase of matter, which wasn't even realized when we first started quantum gravity research 10 years ago. So we now know that low temperature quasi-crystals are topological phases of matter. They have these bizarre quasi-particles called phonon uh, phasons, and they have time crystals in them. So a time crystal, if we can agree, is a periodic uh, change of coordinate of a mass that does not use energy to periodically change its coordinate. And so a, a, so a low temperature quasi-crystal has experimental evidence that an atomic mass uh, changes its coordinate by one angstrom of distance without any energy, by, i.e. by tunneling. And, and certain types of phasons um, tunnel back and forth. So an angstrom this way, an angstrom that way, back and forth. So that is a time crystal. So quasi-crystals have time crystals on them. But you don't hear that talked about a lot in the literature simply because Frank Wilkseck, for example, doesn't even know very much about quasi-crystals. So we're really excited to meet you. Um, David got really excited yesterday and wrote all of us a really nice email that kind of primed us for this talk and some other stuff also in the conversations earlier in the week. Um, but yeah, I'd love to figure out how, how we can cross pollinate, you know, ideas. Cause we've got a lot more ideas than I can possibly share, obviously in an introductory Zoom call, but um, maybe we can somehow add more ideas to your brain and then you can help us synthesize more of where we're trying to go. Yep, yeah, yeah, that would be nice. Now, actually, now that you mentioned time crystals, so time crystals is one of the other instances where diffusive ghosts and bosons appear. Mm -hmm. so, so there is another two or three papers where they actually prove that the breaking of time translations produce these diffusive ghosts and bosons. Oh, uh, mm -hmm. nice. So I see your, I mean, the correlations you are talking about. It's really there. Yeah. Maybe after COVID-19 is over, we can even talk about having you visit us and we can, sh we can do talks for you. You can do more talks for us and really we can, you know, kind of synthesize. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be great. Yeah, yeah. I was exploring a bit your website, but of course in, in person it's much easier to discuss, you know, with a blackboard or something. Yeah, yeah. Thing. Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, one more, one quick thing is, um, so, it, it appears to me that, um, that there's some deep thing to be, first of all, when you showed the Kalapi Yao manifolds in one of your first slides, I just wanna point out that all of those different um, states of the Kalapi Yao manifold, I think you showed about 10 or 12 of them, yeah. um, but there was one state of the Kalapi Yao that is a sort of limit, right? And that's the symmetric Kalapi Yao structure uh, that was on the bottom lower left of your um, of your set of 12. And when you look at that Kalabi Yao manifold, you can see uh, that it has quasi-crystal symmetry, uh, which is called H3 symmetry. So that, um, that would be the one on the bottom lower left. So you can see that the orientation of that there is along the uh, five-fold axes of symmetry. It's five-fold, not mm -hmm. ten-fold, because every other one is a, mm -hmm. a different, is a little bit different. But that's a five-fold symmetry, yeah. and so I find I, I, of course, string theorists do not pay attention really to a golden ratio mathematically. Uh, that's that's sort of part of quasi-crystals. But I was going to tell you that one of the things I'd love to share with you more. I don't have a great explanation for it, but it, it's, it's kind of seems important, just like the five-fold symmetry of the Calabi-Yau manifold seems interesting. 
um, and that is um, black hole equations of um, Carlo Rovelli and um, Paul Davies. And then Marcello has a similar equation to Carlo Rovelli's. But anyway, we, um, we see that, I mean, a, a way to oversimplify it is that if we assume, um, if we assume quantum mechanics to be true, and if we assume general relativity to be true, and if we assume thermal dynamics to be true, and if we look at those truths through the lens of mathematical devices of um, loop quantum gravity, and, and we consider um, the Mersey parameter, anyway, what we get is this um, beautiful equation that, on the, that, that unifies in some sense, or relates in some sense, uh, G, H, uh, and C. And the way that they're related in these black hole equations on the right side of the equation is exactly the golden ratio. So it's very rigorous. And then Paul Davies did it without assuming quantum mechanics to be true. He just said, let me assume general relativity is true. Let me assume um, thermal dynamics is true. <clears throat> and let me study a particular um, special um, non-arbitrary phase in, the black, in a black hole's um, entropy and, and look at what comes out. And what comes out again on the right side of the equation is the golden ratio. So, but I don't understand, I don't think any of us deeply understands here why that is at a really deep level. Um, I mean, other than the rigor of the mathematics, right, which can be understood. It's like, okay, but well, what is, what else? Like, what is that trying to tell us? I mean, who would have predicted that, you know, that a fundamental equation relating CH and, and Boltzmann's, you know, Boltzmann's formalism and C, H, and G would, would have the golden ratio as the, as the relationship between them. So to me, it's a, it's a clue. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is black holes are a powerful laboratory because you get rid of the noise. You, you take things to the limit, right? So you're taking thermodynamics and quantum mechanics and gravity to the limit where you clean things up. And it's at limits you can see things. But material science might be another way to explore something similar to limits, you know? So we, of course, here think that space-time itself <clears throat> is based on quasi-crystal mathematics. <clears throat> and so therefore, <clears throat> at 23 orders of magnitude larger, when you get approximately ideal quasi-crystals, right? You can get clues because it's telling you something. <clears throat> it's, it's, it's like a limit as opposed to a, a tree, <laughs> right? Or or just some gas where, where it's, it's yeah. too complicated and too noisy, it's not near the limit, so. Uh, yeah. yeah, Mateo, I really liked your talk. I probably could ask you about five questions, but I'll try to keep it limited. Um, so just to be clear on the picture that you're describing for this hologram and gravity and the quasi-crystal, is it essentially some bulk boundary duality where the quasi-crystal is on the boundary? Yeah, so my idea is just basically exactly. So the, the dual descriptions in terms of field theory of this gravity theory is actually a quasi-crystal. And uh, I can basically do the computation from the gravity side. And I find uh, basically all the typical expectations that you will expect from a quasi-crystal. So the idea is that these kind of gravity theories are exactly dual to a quasi-crystal. So, yeah. Awesome. Want, so that's, that's the slogan. Uh, awesome. So, in the so, what gravitational phenomena are these uh, diffusive Goldstone modes uh, describing? Yeah, that's a nice question. Uh, I I believe it's related to the dynamics of the black hole horizon. So that's a bit the kind of picture that I was trying to convey here. This, of course, is still very pictorial, but uh, let me see. It's basically this kind of picture. So imagine this is the the black hole horizon. Okay, right. So it's a spherical black hole, maybe a ball. And uh, now, how we perturb a black hole, right, gravitationally? What we're doing is basically we're sending a gravitational wave, right? So imagine right. a gravitational wave bump into a black hole, then the black hole deforms it, and that's exactly actually uh, how gravity deforms space time, if you like. And uh, these kind of deformations, it's really similar to basically the dynamics of, okay, in this picture, for example, of a fluid, of a stone in a fluid, but in, in my case, the dynamics is really similar to quasi-crystals. Now, 
sense, a better understanding in terms of really which kind of phenomena from the gravitational point of view you have to look at to see this phase. That's something that I was thinking, like uh, which kind of, uh, you know, experiment or cosmology observation or whatever you can do to pinpoint that dynamics. That is something that is not clear. But pictorially, that's the idea that I have in mind. It's basically, it has to do for sure with the, uh, so it has to do for sure with dissipations because it's some kind, it needs some energy, some thermal things. And uh, basically 90% of, the, uh, of the, the fun happens at the black hole horizon because it's where all the, the funny physics is there, right? It's a bit like what Lee was saying there, all the limits, are, everything is pushed to the limits, all the information is there, all the dissipation is there. And uh, basically that's the core. So most of the dynamics happen over there. I see. Yeah, um, I'll have to share this with a colleague. Uh, uh, someone who studies twister theory looked at shock waves on a black hole horizon, did some really crazy uh, general relativity computations there. So it might be related, but he didn't really look at the quasi-crystal side, obviously. Um, so yeah, my final question, I guess, is have you thought about gravity as a gauge theory? And do you think that these modes would be related to understanding, would it be useful for looking into like gravity weak unification and kind of like Higgs stuff and the gravitational implications of that? Well, what is clear here is that uh, that mode clearly coming from a symmetry. So, right. and, uh, the, and it's also a symmetry, which is not a space-time symmetry because we, we prove it that it's not really translations. So it's not like, uh, let's say a symmetry of the space-time, but it's, it's better some internal symmetry. So here it comes a bit more complicated because in principle, right, to understand gravity, what you would expect to do is basically gauging the space-time symmetry, right? If you, if you have a, a good way of gauging space-time symmetries in a quantum way, et cetera, basically you will get a theory of quantum gravity. And uh, now this is an additional internal symmetries. And uh, the, the thing that is not that clear to me is what is the requisite or why basically the theory of gravity needs these extra internal symmetries. So notice that this symmetry that I was talking, uh, at least at this stage, is global. Because basically, the, the, this, the physics of the quadric crystal is basically like, you know, you have this embedding in this higher space time, but this is global because basically uh, you, you move it all the way around. Now, if you make it local, then, then I don't know exactly what should happen. I, su I suppose that the dynamics will be kind of similar and kind of related to the uh, Fang idea of maybe of basically making local rippling of, of the structure. So maybe uh, that could be related to some kind of local distortion of the space time or something like that. But I have, uh, I mean, it's definitely interesting, but I, I, at this stage, I have no clear idea how to formalize it in terms of, uh, you know, what computation to do or what equations or, or things like that. Right, so it sounded like you were saying the global symmetry was on the, the boundary, right? Yeah, exactly. So the, the, that's, you know, the, there is a long discussion about global symmetries in theory of gravity, right? And so uh, could like the standard model or some gut symmetry become inter an internal symmetry in some unified field theory in the bulk that becomes a global symmetry on the boundary? Yeah, the, the big problem with global, yeah, it, it's very similar actually. It's exactly what you're saying. So in this picture of the duality, all the gauge symmetry which are in these gravitational descriptions become global at the bulk. And uh, the boundary, sorry. But this is exactly what happens for all the symmetry. So if you want to describe something which at the boundary is as a, I don't know, a global U1, what you have to put is you have to put a gauge field which is gauged local in the bulk. And the relation is exactly this kind of relation between local and global. Now, the big problem with global symmetry with gravity is basically all this discussion that probably you are aware that people believe that, you know, quantum gravity basically avoids global symmetry. So the, the, the usual statement that you hear around is that in a theory of quantum gravity, there can be global symmetry. So the way global symmetry can appear in nature are basically two. One is you have a global symmetry at low energy and then it's broken when you go to small scales like Planck scales or whatever. Or two, you have an emergent global symmetry. And that's exactly, for example, the, the case of the standard model, like you're saying. So we know that, for example, in the standard model, the baryon number is conserved. So there is a symmetry which is global, 
And this means that at a certain point, when you go low in energy, this global symmetry has to appear. Now, I believe that there's no, uh, let's say, agreement of how this can happen. But yeah, there's certain relation between global and, and local, which is interesting. Because, okay. you know, gravity, basically, gravity wants to make everything local, right? Because theory of uh, general relativity is basically that statement, right? You make all the transformation local, and uh, that's what you get, basically. Awesome. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, we'll have to talk more. I have some ideas, but I still have to learn some more. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, when you speak of global symmetry, you're not just restricting yourself to black holes. It can be the universe as a whole, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. so I, so we, I had the pleasure of uh, becoming friendly with Paul Steinhardt because he's kind of like a hero of mine because he predicted quasi-crystals before Schechtman discovered them. And unfortunately, he didn't share in the Nobel Prize, even though normally the guy who predicts it usually shares it with the experimentalist. But he also made these, um, you know, he also made these big theories, obviously, in, you know, in cosmology. So anyway, so I asked him, I said, hey, Paul, have you ever thought about applying your knowledge of quasi-crystal mathematics, right, to, to fundamental physics like gravity theory. And he said, yeah, of course, I've thought about it. That would be awesome, but I can't get past, you know, the anisotropy issue, right? Like, I don't see evidence, you know, of, of this idea. And the, the problem with his thinking, and I didn't, I never got the chance to really continue the discussion with him because unfortunately I didn't know the answer to his problem at the time he shared it with me. But as our program has uh, evolved, then I realized that everything in, our, in the way our model is, it's, it's, a, it's kind of like a cellular automata approach. And imagine that you have a universal scale quasi-crystal at a Planck frame. So a frozen object mathematically, it's a, it's a Planck thing, Planck time thing. But anyway, where, what you have with a quasi-crystal is you can, you can have an infinite number of vertices, but there's only one vertex that's special, and that's the rotational center of the quasi-crystal. But an arbitrary projection of a, fin of, of a finite projection window from a hyper lattice will not uh, give you a rotationally symmetric quasi-crystal. You'd have to strategically place a point from the hyper lattice at the center of the hyper height of the projection window. Then you can get, um, and that, it has to be at the center of the hyper height and the center of the hyper width, right? In order to be at the center of the projection such that you have icosahedral symmetry if you project it to 3D, you know, H2, H3, or H4 symmetry, you know, depending on the dimension. Anyways, but if you were to take, uh, let's say 100, 100 million such randomly selected projections, and average it over time, then it would average out to the same thing. It would average out essentially to the to the to what we call the cent the rotational center. We call it the center emperor because there's these objects called empires and emperors in quasi crystals. But anyway, with sufficiently large numbers of randomly selected uh, shifts of your projection window, it averages down to the middle. So in other words, over the time domain, it, it averages back to, uh, to your H3 or H4 or 2 symmetry. And I didn't have enough knowledge at the time to explain that to Paul Steinhardt. But, um, but yeah, I see nature as basically being broken symmetry. You know, if you, if you take small numbers of frames and average it, but as you get larger and larger, you know, the, the Planck moments times 14 billion years of the universe, it's, you know, fantastically close to averaging H3 symmetry, but you'd have to take it over all that time. This is a bit the idea of emergence, basically.